This is the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast, number 27. I am joined by my friend Steve Nutter, and we are very happy to have on the show Andy King, CRT repair guy, very, very knowledgeable in the field. If you follow Andy on Twitter, you'll see all the time, all the projects that he's doing. Um, He really not only is repairing a vast array of CRTs, but also has a tremendous knowledge on RGB modding, uh, that as well, one of the best resources on that. So we're going to talk all about that kind of stuff, talk about fixing up CRTs, talk about repairing monitors today. So Andy, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. Good to be here. That's cool. All right. So, I mean, you're repairing all the time. Is that, is this your full-time gig right now, fixing stuff? No, no. I I don't even know. Like, it, it started as like a little hobby and then we uh, we moved to an apartment that cost more. So it's like, I got to ramp up my, my job here, <laughs> my second job. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm a I'm an engineer by day uh, and a CRT repairman and console monitor by night. So I just split my time when I can. Okay. Now I saw that uh, you, like me, you have a degree in computer science. Is that right? Yes. Yep. So you're coming from the software side. Is that your first, is software the first... One for you, and then you move later into hardware, or how's your relationship between the two? Yeah, I started with software. Honestly, um, I always found hardware engineering to be very intimidating. I didn't. I honestly didn't think I'd be, you know, smart enough to finish that degree in school. So I just went software. <laughs> um, but I've always been like into like on a hobby level. I've always been into like tinkering with electronics, and you know, when I was a kid, I was taking apart my N sixty four and stuff. So. Um, I'm pretty happy with where with where I've gotten with this stuff now. Okay, yeah. and so I mean, we don't need to go into the details, but your work is it is it software, hardware? It's software, sort of yeah. Broad? It's yeah. software. Yeah. Okay, I do right. right now. I'm doing like UX and UI design. Okay, right on. And then you come home in the evening, and it's time to work on some CRTs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, usually after my son's asleep. Okay, <laughs> how old your son? He's uh, almost four. Okay. So he's right. super active and always interested in what daddy's working on. So <laughs> daddy just happens to be working on uh, very dangerous CRTs that he can't figure out. <laughs> so. yes. That is true. Yeah. So, um, Andy, you're out of the West Coast. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, we were ta- or you just mentioned that you moved to a new space. And so are you in somewhat of like a limited space right now that – um, I mean, I, I know like where I'm at, I'm very happy, but, I, but you know, CRTs are, they take up so much space. <laughs> My... So I just mean, is there, what's the challenges for you <laughs> with, yeah, there's some challenges. <laughs> uh, well, this is, the, this is, we currently are in like a, a house that's, uh, we have the top half of a house now. So I'm very grateful to have that extra space. But before we lived in a little shoebox apartment, uh, and uh, it was hard for me to have more than like one or two TVs at a time including the ones I owned. So it was like very cramped, <laughs> but now I'm, I've got my little space carved out over here. I'm actually in the, the corner of <laughs> right next to the kitchen over there. Oh, my, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my uh, little space is just this square that I have just completely filled to the brim with as much <laughs> tools and workspace as possible. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's always like I've spent, Oh, tons of time the last maybe month just filling my shop with storage, new storage racks and things to try to make things a little bit better. Yeah, I and, saw, I was, uh, I'm jealous. It's of like, the <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah, it gets, you're still, you move them. Or I got so tired of my problem was I'd be working on stuff and I'd have to shuffle it around e- itself. You'd like, I need that monitor now to work on. And then I'd move 10 to get away, get to it. And then I have to move those 10 back yeah. after. So it was, you know, you're killing yourself at the same time trying to work on things. Yeah. I, that reminds me of another thing I was going to say is with the whole space constraints, I am very thankful that my wife allows me to have a small pile of CRTs in the, I guess it's the living room right now. I swear I have some TVs because <laughs> I got, I, you know, sometimes I'm waiting on parts or, uh, you know, something's just not working out. So I just, you know, want to switch to another monitor. And so I've got a, a back stock of stuff that people have dropped off for me to work on. But yeah, there's TVs everywhere. 
Yeah. Right on. So how many, uh, usually, uh, at, uh, like how many are you working on at any given time? Let's say jobs, like not your own personal <clears throat> ones. Um, like actually working on, usually like I'll have two out at a time. I don't like to take too many out because then you got parts everywhere and you might lose something. Um, I started putting all the screws and I keep all the little um, the bags from Mauser and I put all the screws in those because I kept losing the screws. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've got probably six or seven in a pile over there right now. I've got a, a 20, uh, 20 M2. PVM 20 M2 and uh, got a couple that I got from e-waste. One of them is a Sony F5 uh, GDM F520, which is, I believe is the four by three version of the FW 900. Um, I might be wrong. Yeah. There's that, a but... couple of different models. I've actually got one of those like right behind where I'm sitting. Mm, yeah. Right it looks there. familiar. It's, yep. That's like this. It's like the C520. Mm-hmm. And so that, I don't know, there's like two versions of it. And one is supposedly a little bit better, but um, they're both, uh, that's, that, that monitor, like once I got that monitor, I was actually comfortable getting rid of my BVMD 20 F1U. Like that one, I was like, I'm fine. I got that. I got mine for a hundred bucks. I was actually quite lucky uh, and it didn't need any work. Did you know those things have hour counters built in? No, I didn't even know that. I did, yeah, I figured that out the other day. Uh, if you you have to have it on with no input, uh, and then you hold the menu button down for I think two seconds, and it brings up a little screen in the center with like a bunch of information, and at the bottom there's a number. Uh, and mine had I think thirteen thousand hours on it, which isn't bad. You know, not great. Okay, so but not just bad. no <laughs> no signal and just hold down menu mm-hmm. and it'll bring up. Yeah, the it's menu. important. It's important to do no signal because if you have a signal, okay. it brings up a different menu. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we could try. It's, that live yeah, it's either the menu going. button or the the little selector. <laughs> you know, it has that little up down uh-huh. selector, and you can press uh-huh. it in for OK. I, it might be that you hold that. Yeah. Button. I don't remember which. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I really like that monitor, and uh, it was it's a good one, but. So let's, um, how long, when, when, take us back a little bit. Like when was the first time you worked on, and you said consoles, was this like a thing where you moved, maybe started working on consoles and then that grew into CRTs or like what, uh, what kind of the path that, and how long ago did you start like working on your first CRT at all? Uh, the path was actually the opposite, even though it's a little bit scarier that way. I started with CRTs and then moved to consoles. <laughs> uh, I bought my first CRT since when I was in, I think we still had one when I was in middle school. Um, but then we got rid of all of them in the house and I hadn't had one again until um, I think 2018, 2019. I bought mm, a okay. uh, 20-inch PVM 14M, uh, no, uh 1943 MD off of eBay and it arrived destroyed. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know yep. the first thing about repairing them. I just knew that it was dangerous and did not open them. So uh, I found, I was lucky enough to find a very old uh, repair shop in my town that did work on TVs still. They, they had mostly pivoted to plasmas and HD TVs, but they would, the guy had CRT repair chops and he knew, you know, the basics. Uh, and I took it to him and he worked on it and he was like, yeah, I opened it up. There was a bunch of boards inside that were cracked. So, you know, I bridged, I bridged the the cracks in the boards, but it still won't work. So, you know, I'll just, I'll give it back to you, you know, uh, no charge on the labor. Just, you know, it's an old piece of shit TV, you know? <laughs> and so he gave it back to me and I, I took it home all depressed. And I was like, Oh man. And I was like, I'll give it one more shot. Let me just, you know, plug in my, uh, Nintendo and see, see if it works. And I figured out that what, what had happened is he didn't know how the inputs on the front work. Uh... So he had repaired it. But he didn't know it because there was no signal. Didn't know how to test yeah. it. Which I, I yeah. can understand because, you know, the front panel of those things is very confusing to someone who's never, you know, dealt the, with one before. The 40s, the 40s have always been like that. You know, any of them, 8s, 13s. Are they they're, the ones with they're the like on screen display? Yes. Yeah, and yeah it's like, all analog like controls a, on front. It's like a codex, you know. 
to try to figure out how to just switch between inputs and half the time people would sell it people used to see, you could be able to get those usually on yes. ebay because it would be like it powers on i don't know it it can't it's untested but it powers on and you could mm-hmm. always find decent deals on those used yeah to. those days are, are sadly gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah <laughs> even if but that even was, if it's clearly broken and it's showing like a wonky blue and green screen and it's just like the guy <laughs> will want like 400 dollars for it and say it's good for retro gaming <laughs> yeah just needs a little bit of work. That's yeah. it. Not, it not work for me, though. I'm going to get my yeah, $400 no and, you know, you can fix it. No. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff on there. We're always laughing at, at CRT listings. But um, so it started <laughs> with that and it was the, the 1943 MD. MD. Yep. And yeah. uh, so, like, yeah. once you got it working, when did you start working on it? Uh, I did open it up to try adjusting the, the controls, which they're conveniently, they're all grouped in the back, um, right on those monitors, you, so right next not, to the flyback, right next to the flyback, <laughs> but at least you're not like wandering around in the chassis with a, with uh-huh. a screwdriver, but that was kind of intimidating for me. And the, I think the tube on it was tired. Honestly, I, I don't know for sure. Cause I didn't have a tester at the time, but. Uh, I, I went ahead and sold it because my wife and I were moving and we we're moving into that shoebox apartment and there was just no room for that. So I ended up trading it for a 13 inch uh, Amiga 1080 monitor that I could hide in the closet and use in the closet. <laughs> uh, and I think he threw in an Xbox on top for the trade to, to sweeten it a little bit. But but yeah, I, I traded it for a 13 inch um, and then I had that. That was an RGB monitor. Uh, it has S video composite and RGB. Uh, it took me a while to get any equipment that I could even use with RGB. But once once I did, I could see the difference, and I was like, "Okay, this is really cool." Um, Do you remember what that first console was that you hooked up with RGB? I think it was a. I wanted to hook up my Wii, but you can't do that without modding them. They only do components. So I think I ended up hooking up my PS2. Um, and my my N64 couldn't do RGB either. So I only had like a PS2 that could do native RGB at the time. Um, okay. But yeah, so I, I had that monitor for a while. Um, and I had, when I had that list, I, I had sold the PVM on Craigslist. And so I had people contacting me, you know, interested in it. Uh, and one person asked me if I had ever modded them before because he wanted something modded. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, no, I haven't modded it, but you know, I can look into it. So he drops off this 27 inch JVC D series uh, in my little shoebox apartment. And I had on the on the kitchen counter because that was the only place big enough to set it down. It was a nightmare. My wife was furious. <laughs> She's like, get this damn thing out of here. Like, <laughs> what oh, are yeah. you even doing? <laughs> so, Because at this stage, you've not modded this before. You've just said, bring it over. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. And I told him that. Full disclosure. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm a software engineer, but I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and, and, and later I would find out there's really not any point in RGB modding a, a D series anyway, if it's got component input, like there's no that's, point. That's Just... literally, that is literally what I tell every person mm-hmm. that comes up to me. And really I tell them that with any yeah. CRT that they find with component, I'm like, that is completely pointless. Yeah. You, know, you could, totally pointless. you could literally get a transcode, go get a nice yes. transcoder from Mike Chi. And then when you get rid of that, CRT, you can use it. If something happens to CRT, you can switch. You still have a good transcoder. Yep. And component's already there. You're not going to get it. It's like it's like the argument, is component or RGB better on a PVM? Uh, yeah. And there's not really... Uh, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I actually like using component on the PVM because then you can use more of the PVMs. Yeah. Like, you can tinker with their... Uh, chroma and phase, you know, and uh, even I think maybe aperture on that too. So you, you, which you can't do it all in RGB. So yeah, it it's kind of pointless, like you say. <clears throat> yeah, but, so that there's was the first there's one. some. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, no, I, I was. Just, go ahead. 
there's some TVs that I've later learned, like some Toshibas. Um, there might be other ones too that the way that the uh, chroma is processed for um, component video, they have what's called a red push. Um, and that just means that red is like driven way harder than it's supposed to be. Um, so in those cases, you actually can't fix that uh, with the service menu settings. And that's really the only time that I could see a benefit in RGB modding a TV that already had component is if the component processing was somehow bad. Um, but yeah, otherwise just pointless. Yeah, so, so unless what, you got so what, a Toshiba... Or sorry, go ahead, Lewis. Yeah, I was just going to say, so out. you've got this huge 27 inch oh, thing right. sitting yeah. on, the, <laughs> on the kitchen table and it's already got component, but you are yet to come to the conclusion that this is not the optimum way I to never do it did. as you're learning. I never did come to that conclusion when I was working on it. I, I learned that later. <laughs> I finished it for him. Um, yeah, it... It took me a while. It was very confusing, like understanding, like, why am I like, a, you know, grounding these resistors, like on the video signals, like terminating them with 75 ohm resistors? Why am I doing that? Like, why do I have to guess what like inline resistance to use? Like all these weird things that, you know, make sense once you understand like a little more about analog video. But at the time I was just like flying blind, reading threads on shmups, trying to figure it out so you're just and... consulting information on the internet trying to piece it together at first yeah yeah and eventually i i got it working but i the terminate the uh termination wasn't quite right it was coming in super bright and i didn't know how to fix it at the time so i just adjusted the tv to make it look correct but <laughs> <laughs> the guy the guy was like i was fully transparent with the guy the whole time i was like i don't know why you're having me do this i don't know what i'm doing uh here you go <laughs> Um, yeah. So, so since that time, how many have you, do you have any idea like how many you've RGB modded up to now? I mean, I've seen you do some even more recently. Yeah. I, I, I slowed down on the RGB mods. I, I, I enjoy repairing things more, but, um, I've been doing this for about three years or so, maybe almost four. Um, in that time I've probably done maybe 20 25 rgb mods hmm. um they're usually pretty time consuming and if you charge like an honest price for what your labor's worth especially if it's one that hasn't been uh documented already so i'm having to figure it out hmm. it's usually you're getting into depending on how much they already spent to get the tv to bring it to you they're getting into pvm territory sometimes um hmm. depending on what it is I if you really... had to ballpark like a TV you've not seen before, are you ball like five hours, ten hours, twenty hours? There was one that I really regretted even working on. It was for it was it was a personal project, so I, you know that means unlimited time investment. <laughs> 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 it was a Panasonic thirteen inch uh, CCTV. Uh, I think it was the S thirteen ninety Y was the model. And it has an analog OSD, which is, you know, requirement number one for RGB mods. Uh, but the impedance was very strange, or um, it might even have been DC bias. I never figured it out. Uh, I spent, like, over a month of, like, a few hours a day working on that stupid thing. Uh, I ended up designing an entire circuit board with, a, with help from some of my friends on Discord that are other engineers. Uh, we designed an entire amp driver, RGB amp driver to, to feed the, the jungle IC, the, the correct signal voltages, or at least so we thought would be correct to get it to actually display RGB correctly. And even then I'm trying to remember what the, what problems it still had. I, I think the, 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 like, if you look at the 240p test suite, it has one test called color bars and that test is very important it's the one that shows the r g and b uh right. gradients yeah. and if your rgb mod isn't done correctly you're either going to be missing the the tail end of the gradient or the brighter end is going to be too dark okay. um and that means you've modded it incorrectly or, or you know something's wrong with your signal levels and i couldn't ever get there was there was always some compromise going on there with the with the signal levels i couldn't get it right um, 
And I just, I eventually just moved away from that project because it was just, I'm, I'm serious. Like I'd spent over a month on it, uh, just not working on anything but that. <laughs> yeah, right. So you just uh, had to give up. That was your. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah. I, I left it where it was. It worked, but it wasn't worth keeping. I passed it on. Um, and since then, I, someone's actually shown me on Smups. There's some other people that have found it seems to be a pretty common monitor. I've had three or four people just in the last month uh, contact me wanting them modded, and I keep telling them no because it's just a, a waste of time. Um, but someone yeah. on Shmups is trying to figure out the actual problems uh, with the DC bias and everything. So if that ever gets figured out, they are moddable. But I tend to think that if you're having to add a whole other PCB into the TV just to get it to take RGB input, you should probably move on to a different tv it's just my my personal <laughs> yeah, opinion that's you're well, investing that, too much yeah, time we're moving into that territory where you should go and do like what uh dan mons did where he used a different chassis that was just compatible with a certain tube you can get like a generic arcade chassis that has rgbs on it mm -hmm. so you could just use that and get your signal into that and you'd be better off doing that as opposed to just I mean, I'll be, I've I've done two RGB mods in my whole time, uh, and I usually I always I said I I did them for myself, and there was so much time put into those two that I was like I'm not I can't do this for you. You realize, like you said, it's too much time. <coughs> Sorry. When when you can uh, you know get repair work, you can't. Yeah, you know, it's not the same. It's like yeah. It, yeah, I, I can bang out several repairs in the time that it takes to do an RGB mod. So it's like I have to price it accordingly. And some people just are like understandably aren't willing to like pay for that labor just because it's kind of ridiculous when you can get a PBM. But yeah. What were your experience, Steve, doing the, the mods? Because were you going uh, from a guide on the internet? Yeah, or I was going it? from some very early guides, and I would just find a TV. I found like a Trinitron that was a KV 27-inch from the later 90s that uh, only had S-Video, and it was very documented, The actually, that RGB mod. There was even like a build-out guide for how to terminate all the levels specifically. That I found, so I was like, "Well, I found this TV. It has this part. I'm just going to do it according to this guide," and I did it, and it worked like right away. Like it had no problems because I guess I did the whole process right. The problem was is the tube, uh, and like the yoke was just miserably awful on this set, which is a big deal. Like with those those Trinitrons, a lot of them just look terrible. You know, edge. Mm -hmm. geometry edge convergence yep. and this one i never could get it right i made videos going back years of me just playing with the yokes and stuff and uh, some guy finally came by the shop a couple months ago and dropped off a bvm 13 inch and i was like he's like yeah you got anything you want to sell like an rgb and i was like man i got this 27 inch the first one i ever did if you want it you know you could buy it <laughs> and i was like it doesn't look good but it works and it's got huge scan lines if you just stare at the middle 80% <laughs> it looks great but if you stare at the edge you're going to give yourself like a headache <laughs> and uh a literal headache you know and and he was like okay and he's he was super happy with it so you know i i <laughs> i don't nope. after that i was like this is too much work and you end up yeah. with like an awful image at the end cuz it still doesn't have the hardware to drive a good edge yeah, the monitor yeah, itself. That's, it never that's had that to begin problem. with. Yeah, uh, the twenty-seven inches and above is really the the sweet spot for RGB mods because that's kind of where the PVM inventory dries up. You know, so if you can get a really good consumer twenty-seven inch to start with, you can turn that into pretty close to what a twenty-seven inch PVM can deliver as far as RGB. You're, you're going to miss, you know, the, all the other features that PVMs have, but. Um, Someone brought me a, a Sony KV27V42. Uh, I want to say it is, uh, which is the BA4D chassis, and the the Sony chassis are important to know because each one is is moddable uh, a different way, and so if you if you if you know what chassis it is, the mod method is going to be the same generally, no matter what the size and model number is. Um, 
there's like six different Sony chassis and five of them are RGB moddable from my, from what I understand at least. But this one uh, was pretty simple to, to RGB mod. It just needed the very basic, that they call it the OSD mux, which is when you inject your RGB signals in line with the OSD uh, RGB signals uh, to combine them into one. And you use inline resistance to get the signal levels appropriate so that they mix without one being too high. Um, and that's really the way that you want to go because then you can still see the OSD and the TV still behaves the same way as it did before you modded it as far as like being able to adjust settings and see what you're doing in the service menu. Um, and so I modded that one for them and it looked fantastic. Like I've had 27 inch PVMs in and they didn't look that good. <laughs> Like yeah. the, t- the tube that he had was low hours uh, and it was just bright and sharp and it looked fantastic. I, w- I was jealous of it, to be honest. <laughs> I thought I might, Andy, just uh, for those listeners at home who may have heard the term RGB mod and then wondered, um, you, you kind of touched on it here a little bit now that, um, you know, there's, there's the jungle chip that does the OSD. Kind of just take us back over that again. How the typical yeah. one, like, I guess we'll talk about the jungle uh on-screen display version walk us through how a typical rgb mod works from you know from sure yeah i can i can explain it um i can explain the whole concept first i mean yeah sure um most crts uh, and, until you go back uh like several decades most crts any all modern crts for the most part uh process video in rgb eventually all of them. Um, that's like the purest form of the signal that the TV can display because that's the 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 electron guns in the tube are R, G, and B. Um, so whatever your whatever signal you're feeding it, all the the ICs and everything inside are converting that signal into the proper R, G, B signal at the correct voltage and everything to be displayed on the screen. So if you can find a way to feed R, G, B to the TV from your input source, theoretically you're getting the, the purest signal because there's no uh, adjustment or processing that has to be done. Component has good signal quality, but it's being processed. It, it, it comes in a different color format than RGB, so you're relying on the TV to be able to do that conversion well, um, which goes back to what I mentioned before with some TVs process red too strong or, or whatever. So, and and when, you, when you use component video, you're exposing yourself to all the other adjustments that the TV has like sharpness, chroma, phase. If you're using a PVM, those adjustments are good. If you're using a consumer TV, those adjustments almost always make your picture look like shit. So the more stuff you can bypass, the better. Uh, So that's why people want an RGB mod in the first place. Um, Generally, the TV's RGB signal that it processes, uh, it doesn't process it until almost the neck board uh, and at that point, it's been amplified to any number of voltages. It depends on the, the manufacturer and, and what TV it is. But it's usually like anywhere from two and a half volts to I've seen as high as 10 volts uh, peak to peak. Uh, and a normal uh, RGB signal from a console is only 0.7 volts peak to peak. So there's a huge discrepancy there. So that's why you have to feed your signal to the jungle chip is because the jungle chip is going to amplify it to what the TV expects. Not all jungle chips can process RGB input. They just weren't designed that way from the factory to save money or whatever. What um, is a jungle chip? The jungle chip is generally it's the last IC that, that is processing video in, in the TV before it reaches the neck board. Um, it handles any number of things depending on how new the TV is and how much money they were trying to save. There's there's jungle chips that are, are called a one chip design, which essentially they're CPUs. They have like... 100 200 pins uh and they they're they're doing the osd the uh if the tv has a tuner like for uh, over the air video there it's doing the the tuner stuff it's it's processing all the inputs it's processing all the adjusts it does everything and those are generally not desirable because those chips because they inherently try to handle everything in one chip there's usually not a lot exposed for you to take advantage of as far as rgb mods is and stuff like the chip has the osd built in so it doesn't need any osd input you know it's just gonna be outputting osd on its own 
there's nowhere for you to inject your own signal. So that's what the jungle chip is, is it's just processing, uh, at, at minimum, it's processing the input video signals and amplifying it for the neck board. It may also be handling uh, horizontal oscillation, um, sync, other stuff as well, OSD. So what, you, what you're assuming when you're doing an RGB mod is that you have a good place to inject your RGB signal. Um, I've done a few mods where I inject it straight to the neck, the neck board, and try to amplify it myself. It doesn't usually go well. I, I've had a few good examples of it, but it's not something I would ever recommend someone do. Um, you want a jungle chip that can take. I get RGB. that question a lot. Yeah, and, uh, I've never. I was like, I don't. I'm not even trying it. But so you have you have done that, and is it is it a thing that you just couldn't amplify the levels high enough, or? It, that's you exactly it. Amplify? It's yeah. it, usually what what you get if you're lucky enough to have a service manual with the TV. Sometimes it'll give you an example waveform picture for what the mm -hmm. signals are coming out of the jungle, and it'll tell you what the volts peak to peak is. Uh, and that's only part of the story. Like you have to figure out the DC bias, which is uh, to to explain it in a basic terminology it's it's how far above zero or ground the signal has been elevated um and if you get that wrong then uh you're gonna have other problems like maybe your black levels aren't gonna be right or um it's gonna not be clamping correctly which means that your black levels are gonna vary depending on the signal input so some scenes are gonna be brighter than they should or have no contrast uh and it's gonna look like the screen's broken because it's like changing brightness on you um, so it's just, it's a whole can of worms that, that you really that's need. That's getting to... very close to Thomas Dady with the open source CRT yes. project, isn't it? That whole yeah. thing. Yeah, you're we getting into. what a huge friggin' project that is, so. You're getting into engineering right. territory, and I'm not, like, I'm not an analog, I don't know analog video that well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, tend, I tend to avoid that. Uh, the best way okay, to go. so we've got the, the jungle chip. Um, okay, because I, I, I misunderstood. I thought the jungle chip was producing the OSD. But on, okay, Sometimes so on later ones, it could be. Sometimes mm -hmm. it is on those later ones. But often on the, the previous model, something else is produced in the OSC, and then you're tapping into that line as it enters the jungle chip. Yeah, the typical, the typical 90s design uh, strategy was to have one chip that was the OSD processor. They call it the Micon or the microcomputer. Um, and then have one chip... Uh, processing the video signals and taking input from the OSD. So those two are in constant communication for displaying the OSD information. And that's perfect for, for our purposes because we can in, like inject right in the middle of that line of communication with our own signals. And as long as we know what we're doing and have the right levels, we can get our own video in there, no problem. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and just to, just to interject with my experiences, that's exactly... What he just explained right there, that was like when I was trying to get this whole project started for myself to do RGB mods, that's exactly the process I did. I wanted to find the TV, and I did. They were both TVs from the 90s that were the two-chip design. One was a Sony, one was a Samsung. Hmm. And you do, you're trying to interject your RGB and uh, um, into that uh, OSD path where the chips are communicating between each other. Um, now, yep. back when I did it, we weren't even smart enough to try to think of a nice place on the board that wasn't like populated to interject it. We would do stupid stuff like pull the pins on the mm -hmm. chip and then wire into the chip and then wire over to a switch, you know? Yep. And, yeah. Uh, it's come a long way. Yeah. And it's definitely, cause that's like, I've got one that's, that's the way those both those were done. It was like that. Yeah. I've, I've done, a, I did a few very early on that were like that. Cause that was just the way that people recommended doing it. Uh, and, uh, I've had to redo a few that people have brought me from other people modding them that were done that way. Uh, and it's just, I, I live by the, by the, the rule that you shouldn't be cutting anything that doesn't need to be cut. You shouldn't be removing anything that doesn't need to be removed. Try to just like when you're camping, leave it as you came, you know, <laughs> uh, I hate when I open something up and it's just a, like a mess of random changes and attempts at things but it is what it is you know sometimes you, this is the only project you've done with tvs and you just wanted a you know, rgb mod on your tv and you tried it you know there's no there's no shame in that but 
Um, I prefer to not be cutting anything. I had one TV that was done the way you were just talking about, Steve, where the RGB signals were being looped through a switch uh, that you'd have to flip to get the RGB input or the OSD, but you couldn't have both. Right. And the person that owned it, their house had carpet and the switch was metal. And I guess they just got really unlucky one day with static electricity. And when they touched that switch to flip it, it zapped the jungle chip with static electricity and killed it. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. That's, that's pretty dang random. Crazy. There's, but yeah, there's legitimate reasons sense. to not be looping. Oh yeah. Internal stuff through a switch that's exposed like that. It's. Um, oh yeah. The one I've got is, yeah, it's a big metal switch too. So it's yeah. like, it's uh like, like I said, it was the original stuff and nobody was, mm-hmm. it was like, can't remember who um bob and jose cruz had a video that was out that was like kind of going through an rgb mod it wasn't really a tutorial and then uh there may have been one more video that i'm just not thinking about right now that was like an rgb mod video um but since then over like the last five years there's been tons of them right and everybody's doing something a little bit different a lot of the times Mm -hmm. But nowadays, like you say, it is um, the the new method is a little bit more confusing to somebody walking in because they don't really understand. And that's really what I got. I was like, look, that's too much research for me. I don't really want to go down that path. But where they don't understand how to mux the signals together and they don't understand how to read the schematics and find the right injection points, you know, uh, so. The good news is, though, that now it's progressed to such a point where there's a lot better ways to do it that are, like you said, safer to the TV. You could really even go back and undo them Mm -hmm. if you wanted to and not harm something uh, for some reason. But, um, yeah, it's definitely gotten a lot better quality wise. Yeah, I I really have to thank personally the, the one guy that really I saw just putting so many hours into like the research on this and also just helping people do it right. Uh, is this guy on Schmups, his name is Mark, his username is Mark Ozlad or O-Z-L-A-D. I don't know how you pronounce it, but um, okay. I've spoken to him on Discord since, and he's a really nice guy. And he, uh, he was one of the first, if not the first, that I saw doing the OSD muxing method. Uh, and he has spent pro- at least the last two years, if not longer, hand replying to everyone that asks on shmups how to mod xyz tv he'll give them a a hand drawn schematic you know give them the resistor values try this they'll come back they'll try it send them some pictures this is what i got this is what it looks like he'll send them a new schematic with new resistors and just work it through it with them uh guy's a saint yeah (laughs) um but definitely i'm trying to get all this documented you know anytime i figure out a mod for a specific TV. I put a page up on my site and just try to document the methods so that no one's guessing. And anyone that's just go- blindly Googling, trying to figure out how to do it themselves, they can at least get a, a correct list of instructions. Um, Cause God knows. I think Google that's a good transition, of... right? Oh yeah. Good transition point here over to the website, the CRT database.com. It is yeah. an excellent resource and the little that i knew in our discussion about rgb mods i basically got from reading the website five minutes before we started the podcast i was like muxing on the osd Hmm, yes i agree it's a great idea it's the way of the future uh so that information i thought was planned uh was planned very well when did you start the crt database andy uh it's probably about a year and a half ago maybe some some somewhere around there once i started getting tvs in that i re- realized i probably wasn't ever going to see again because they were really rare i was like i need to be documenting this uh, i was getting tvs that i couldn't even find on google uh someone brought me an nec uh presentation monitor um i can't remember the i think the series was called data master they abbreviated dm it was an NEC DM-2000, and it was a 20-inch presentation monitor with RGB. There was no listing on Google for it. 
uh, no owner's manual, no service manual, no brochures, no, no hint that it even existed on this planet, except that I had one. So, and I asked around on, on everywhere I knew if anyone had heard of it and no one had. So once that happened, I was like, okay, I need to throw this online. And I started with a blog and I, I just, I hate the blog format. I don't like writing blog entries for everything. So I, I designed a, a website since I have a web web dev background and I just threw up a website for it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's yeah, a great that's, resource. I, I think- it is I a mean, good it's, resource. It's a becoming a really good resource. I had a client just, you know, I had a client recently send in a uh, 1942Q, uh, and he's like, oh, can you do that audio mod? And I'm like, sure, actually, I haven't even thought about it yet, and I haven't done it. And I was like, oh, it's just snipping a wire <laughs> in the yeah. easiest spot. And I was yeah. like, yes, thank you, Andy. <laughs> so I was, like, I was like, yep, I did that mod. I was like, it literally <laughs> took, like, I think 20 seconds. It's what very. The, what's the audio mod that requires snipping a wire? What is this? Mod? You want to explain it? You know, yeah, it better than I do. Yeah, it's literally just the. I think it's the. Is it the 40 series, Steve, or was it the 50 yeah, series? It's, so there's only one 40 series that lets you use uh, audio on RGB, and it's the 44 mm-hmm. Q. Like, and now not the eight inch, it's the 13 or the 19 inch screens. Yeah, so they um, they just didn't put the input back there. Um, no, on those other ones, they don't put an input back yeah. there, right? Yeah, and so I I looked at the schematic because I, I usually what happens from an overview perspective is all of the audio inputs from the back go towards a switch and eventually becomes one audio signal, and it just switches between which one it's taking input from depending on what you select on the on the front panel. You know what input you're on. So I figured there's probably a way to just bypass the muting that it's doing on the other uh, inputs. Uh, and sure enough, it ended up being as simple as literally pulling a wire out with some tweezers from the uh, the plug on the input board. Uh, and then suddenly you can use the uh, line A audio input for RGB uh, or line A audio. And then that's all it takes is pulling out a wire. It takes I, 10 yeah, seconds. I could... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's not. Uh, um, that's actually a good project for somebody who's not even that great at messing with CRTs, because yeah. it's a board that's right at the. It's the input mm-hmm. board where you're connecting, and it's on the other side. It's one of those cables going. It's not even like that difficult or like that. Scary it's relatively spot. safe. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, man, this is actually really, really fun. So I haven't. Because I haven't, uh, the last couple I've I've done have been the 44s with the audio. So there's no reason to yeah, yeah. do anything with those. But then I was like, yes. So that yeah. was a great, you had a great, yeah, that's when the last time I got to use your website was last week. <laughs> yeah, and I had a few people tell me, they were like, why do you even care if you want to use the tiny little speaker in your PVM? It sounds like garbage anyway. Why are you using it? It's like, yeah, it does sound like garbage, but... I mean, you have one, so why don't you want the ability to use it? I mean, you know, right, I like you take it, especially when you're testing consoles or whatever. Testing, or you, yeah. You know, taking it with you somewhere. You yeah. don't wanna, mm. You know, if you go take the PVM somewhere, you're not going to carry around a bunch of audio gear. Yeah. Hopefully, it's just with convenient. it. I mean, it's a pain enough. Uh, you yeah. Moving a CRT as it is. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <Let's> start. <laughs> you don't need a reason. Just do gear. it. Yeah. No, I mean, to me, that was great because that was always something that was confusing to me. I was like, why? Because I I was like, the 30 series before that lets you do what you're talking about. You actually can select which audio line to pair with RGB, Mm -hmm. like the 2030, 32, 25, 30s, any of those 30s. And then this one was like after the 30s a little bit or same time period. So it was confusing to me why they wouldn't have it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I little things like that. I, I'm just convinced were Sony's little sales gimmicks to try and talk you into, you know, thinking, oh, well, I should get the 44, you know, series and <laughs> not cheap out on the on the, you know, it's like cars when they just needlessly take features out. <laughs> it's you know, to change it's the like price. that oscilloscope I just bought where you've got to go in and yeah. just update the firmware and do a small little yeah. license hack. 
and then it get, it unlocks it, and it's like, yeah. oh, it's actually like twice too. the oscilloscope right there. Oh, yes, yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the DZ uh, DS ten fifty four Z. Yeah, that's the one. So, yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's talk. Uh, so the CRT database. Let's talk a little bit while we're um, talking about tools. Let's talk about like that's one of the things that I love in this whole field is the different like testers getting to try you and i have talked a couple times behind the scenes about different testing devices and um so like i think you have a big collection of probably tool testers is there anything that that stands out that is like a favorite of one of those or anything that you uh, use a lot more than others it's like for me i had a couple of testers i saw um there was even one that you you got that was like an ic tester transistor oh, tester yes that was a little like build it build it yourself kit i bought the kit i've still never put it together i was just waiting these are fantastic to, yeah that's yeah. it what is that that looks, that looks cool what is that this is a little uh it's got this is called a ziff socket um you can put components in here uh, resistors, diodes, cap capacitors, ICs, whatever. Um, lock them in place with the little lever and push this tester button. Uh, and it tells you what the component is, which sometimes is helpful if you can't, if you don't have a service manual. Mm -hmm. Um, but more importantly, it tests certain components. So it can tell you if a, if a diode is good or not. Um, it can tell you if, uh, an IC is, is, you know, this isn't actually my IC tester. I have a different, I have a tester just for op amps. Uh, that's right. right. Yeah, the one you were just holding was the one I had. I've got that too. That's real cheap in like a kit. Oh, that one. Look at that one. It's even probably cheaper. Yeah, what yeah, was that is, one called? The M tester? Was yeah, this one? is called the M tester. You can get it on Amazon. It takes like 15 minutes to put together. It's not a big deal. No solder. It's like a little anything. cool build kit. Yeah. yeah, I need something like that. that and it's cool. it's cheap too. It's not that expensive. I want to say it was like fifteen bucks or something, right? Yeah, yeah. it's it's around cheap. that price point. Fun um, thing, cool. Yeah, so this this comes in handy. Uh, it's a really quick way to just test components too, if you've got them out of circuit. Uh, it's way faster than dealing with your leads on the multimeter, trying to push down on both sides of a diode and get the right reading and then swap your leads and test it the other way. It takes forever. This can do it in two seconds. Um, and then this is a little tool that I found from a guy that repairs synthesizers, like old like analog synthesizers. Uh, his website's called synthchaser.com. And this just test op amps um uh, uh three different types of op amps and op amps without going into you know too much about what they are they're they're a really common failure point uh in analog electronics they like to blow up um and once they're bad they they're hard to to track down um and you can't really test them with a multimeter you the only way you'd know if it was dead without having a tester is if you touched your fingers to it and it was like burning you Basically, it's the way you tell if an op amp is bad or not. But sometimes they just go open uh, and they don't heat up or do anything at that point. They're just dead. Um, and I have had PVMs in the past um, that had other failures, like the vertical IC blew up or something. And that af the aftermath of that kills other components, including a few op amps and stuff. Um, so I've had to do repairs with, with these things. They've, they've come in handy. So yeah, that that's one, a you, very you take the whole op amp out. And yeah, you got to take it out. Lot, right, and yep. then put it into that device. And it took a 9-volt battery, was it, on the side there? And, yeah. And what? how does it, do you know, does it light up or something if it's bad? Or yeah, it's, got a, good, it's or? got a row of, like, Christmas lights on it that all, they'll, they'll, they'll flash in a strobe because that's how the logic on the op amps is tested. Um, and if it's not strobing properly or if it's not flashing or if the lights aren't coming on, those are three different failure types. For the op amp and all three mean it needs to be replaced um i was fixing and i still haven't finished fixing it but i was i got it because i was working on an old nec multi-sync monitor um similar to this one that i that i have sitting here um it's the nec jc 1304 i think it's also known as the 3ds and it can scan 15 kilohertz up to 38 kilohertz so it can do 240p 480i and 480p 
uh, and computer VGA. Definitely a monitor worth saving, but the one I got was from eWaste and it was just totally blown up, didn't turn on. And the farther into it I got, the more I realized that like half the components on the board were just fried. <laughs> like it's I remember just... your long thread on this one now that you're talking about it more. It's the one where it's just like, oh, here's another piece to this puzzle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I I had to shelve it. It was another project that was just <laughs> I was spending way too much time on it, wasn't getting anywhere with it, um, putting in a lot of money on parts. I replaced tons of stuff that I knew was was bad. I had verified with testers that it was bad. I, I have a schematic file saved on my computer that's just got hundreds of markings all over it from all the components and uh, circuits that I was testing, and it, it's still dead. <laughs> so that's a project for, uh, for Christmas break or something. We'll see. <clears throat> yeah. I got this out too. We were talking about testers. This is my favorite. Oh tester. yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that your tube tester? You yes, use? it's a Sencor uh, CR70 tube tester. It looks like I have the nuclear launch codes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you on this: Do you have um, what are you using to connect to the different styles of tubes when you are using that? Is it uh, is it the pre-made? connections yes. or is it like a homemade one that's got a bunch of different little like random miscellaneous okay so did so yours guess, come yeah, Andy, I mean, did explain, yours come with those yeah i'll explain, explain what the fuck that thing just is it looks amazing <laughs> but walk us okay. through for the rest of us uh what that device is helping you with all right so that device tests crt tubes um so the back of a tube um this is the electron gun right here, and then these are the pins that uh, actually that actually you interface with to, to run the electron guns uh, and do other things like heat the filament. Th there's there's a filament in here, just like old school light bulbs um, that has to heat up. Um, so when you're when you're testing a CRT, you have to test to make sure all that stuff is still good because the the filament, just like in an old light bulb, it's very fragile and it can burn out. Um, and if that filament isn't burning properly, then your CRT is not going to display any picture. Uh, it could be the lowest hours CRT ever. And if the filament burned out for some reason, it's not going to ever work again. So the tester can test that. Um, it, it can also test the electron guns, each, each color to make sure that they're all firing. It can tell you if there's shorts between uh, the different grids in the, in the, in the tube neck, which is also another non-starter for, for a tube. If you've got shorts, it's, it's uh, going to be a rough time. Sometimes you can clear the shorts, but they usually come back. Um, and it usually means the tube is very uh, on its last legs. But yeah, test for shorts. Most importantly for, for what I do day to day, it tests emissions and cutoff. And what that is, is basically it's a way of testing the life. Uh, the, the health of a tube is probably the best way to put it is the health. Um, each electron gun emits uh, phosphor. Uh, and so you're checking the levels of emissions with this tester. And if the emissions are low, uh, the tube is very high hours or it has a short, but if it doesn't have a short, then that means it's high hours. Um, that means it's gonna be dim. And if you turn up the brightness and the contrast and everything on the front, thinking that you know it just needs to be turned up, you're gonna be doing something called overdriving the tube which might get you decent brightness and contrast once you do that, but you're sending such a high power to the cathodes uh, in, the, in the electron gun that you're going to get a really shitty looking picture with very bad like focus or, or definition um, because you're basically just shining a super bright light through a tiny hole trying to make it brighter. Um, so yeah, yeah, you want to make sure you have good emissions. Yeah, on that piggyback on what he just said yeah like when you if you if your tube is really tired and overused once you start turning up those brightness and contrast knobs it it immediately washes out your picture like you'll have extreme the more you turn it up the more like the red will bleed and colors separate yeah and you lose all kinds of a good look colors will change um you know all together sometimes not and you know it's it's so when you when you're when you're yeah you're let's say that the tests you've said so far, all those are just tests 
And that machine you've got, it can do the tests or it can do like a rejuvenation process. Mm -hmm. But I know from what I do on my tester that you can do the tests without it being really any kind of dangerous thing to the tube. Just the testing. Correct? Yep. Or have you ever had anything sour happen just from testing? Well, it depends on what tester you have. Um, I, f I forgot to go over these. I do have... So some of these are pre-made. Okay. But this tester is from, you know, the, the 80s. So... Some of these are for TVs that are so old, I'll probably never see them. And some of them aren't compatible with newer TVs that have different styles of connectors. Um, so what I do in that case is I just, if I ever get a scrap neck board, I just pull the little CRT connector mm -hmm. off of it. Um, and that just makes it easier for me because I can label what each pin is. Um, but regardless of if I have that or not, I can hook up directly to the pins of a CRT using this. It's called a universal adapter. And it's basically just a bunch of pincher clips um, that are labeled with what they are. You know, there's two for the filament voltage, one for the uh, electron gun. You have to, my tester only tests one where, color. Where at did time. you get that? Where did you get that? Came, it came with it. This is a Sencor oh, accessory. Um, need, and it's I only for, need, it's only for right. Sencor testers. I need, I need to make, I need to make one like that out of the crap I've got for mine. I've got a BK yeah. four six seven. The which pin is one out of the three. I I yeah. wrote down the pin out for this somewhere. I could find it for you so you can make one of these yourself. Yeah. Um, that's that's all it do. is. That's it's, the best that's the best idea with the little clip style uh you know uh, wiring I just saw on that attachment compared to the other ideas I was thinking about. So I like that. Yeah. Like the oscilloscope style clips. Yeah so um, I have all those adapters, uh, and I have a spreadsheet that someone was kind enough to make. I don't remember their name or who they are, uh, but they they took an old Sencor used to put out literature for text to to use, and one of them was a big, huge book of like tube numbers and their specs and their pinout, so you knew how to test them. He took that and digitized it by hand, entered it all in the spreadsheet. And um, sorry, my son's just come to see what I'm doing. Hey, it's fine. <laughs> uh, he entered them all in the spreadsheet, this Google spreadsheet. And then he also added modern tubes as he found them. Uh, so I have this huge like 2000 entry spreadsheet that I reference uh, first. And if I can't find it in there, then I have to infer the pinout myself using by either looking at the neck board and tracing the pins right. to see what they are or if i have a schematic sometimes the schematic is labeled most of the time it's not because that's kind of beyond the scope of like the average repair um but yeah that's that's how i test the tubes um and, and then you asked if you can cause damage with testers i can only speak for mine uh this is regarded i don't you're probably steve you're probably familiar with the sencor cr7000 it's the one that's always like people fight over on ebay yeah uh, and they'll buy it for like 600 to a thousand dollars yeah they'll easily go for a thousand bucks now yeah this is the the little brother to that tester it's literally the same functionality and design except it's analog for the display the 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 uh, readout for the tube health is analog instead of a digital display, which I actually prefer. Right. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool yeah, and it's accurate. Way, it's more that's, accurate. That's the way, yeah. Uh, see, um, I, I don't, I, there are so, any of them is so hard, at least, at least compatible, usable ones. They're very hard to find now, like I feel like. I, I don't know. I, you've got one though, Steve? I've got one. It's a B&K model, and it's the only one I've been able to find, like, the save on Pat gave me three B and K models that are compatible. And so I've, the one I have is one of those. It's like the earliest of those and it's got the same kind of dial. It's actually got three dials on it. Uh, analog, you know, sweeps on it and, uh, meters. So, right. But it does the same style thing you're talking about. It's just a B and K brand. Yeah. So this one it's analog and then it can only test one color at a time which mm -hmm. really isn't that big of a deal, especially if you're able to use one of those adapters that I showed you, the plastic square adapters, because those have each pin attached internally for each color. So all I have to do is turn a dial 
now I'm testing red, now I'm testing green, now I'm testing blue, and then I'm done. If I'm using the universal clip leads, I have to manually move the, the uh, one of the clips to each color. So that's kind of annoying, but I, it's be- I got this for $130. So, I mean, you know, it's a value for, I don't mind moving clips if I don't have to spend a grand. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've, I've got a buddy of mine that I've talked about, or I've talked to behind, uh, that's been into this stuff for like years before I did. And he would go around and he would find out things. And like he, right at the tail end after Sony discontinued these is when he got into it and he went and got a lot of the real cheap, like, handouts in new york city like giveaways back when nobody wanted this stuff he actually kept them in storerooms and some of the stuff he has like every tester because he's like i've gotten every tester and um he went around when sony like this was five years ago or six years ago he called sony's warehouse and bought any parts that they had still left in their warehouses new old stock that they had just remaining of anything that went to PVMs or BVMs. He bought every single thing they had because he was like, it was a couple of thousand parts, you know, a couple of hundred bucks worth of stuff. And I just bought everything. And I was well, like, I'm glad it, crazy. I'm glad it went to someone who, you know, saw the value because yeah. Sony would have just thrown it away eventually. Yeah. So he's, but he's always showing me the testers and I'm like, dad, gummit, man, I'm struggling here. Just trying to get one of these things anymore. Yeah. And these testers, no matter what one you get, I strongly recommend recapping them because the caps run at high voltages and most of these testers are like just as old as these CRTs, if not older. Uh, And if the caps aren't good, then the readings that you get aren't going to be accurate. Um, And more importantly, if you're going to be rejuvenating anything, you want the caps to be sending the correct voltages and pulses and stuff. So, um, and this, yeah. this one is desirable for rejuvenation because it has the most comprehensive and safest methods of rejuvenation that were ever available, to my knowledge. Um, better than the BNK ones, uh, it, um, it's the least likely to kill a tube from rejuvenation. Uh, I've successfully rejuvenated a few tubes, both black and white and color. Um, I've... I've done a rejuvenation attempts on Sony's most of the time it doesn't help, but it also hasn't hurt them. You know, they come out the same as you know, they were uh, from the start when I used the light rejuvenation um, and it has shorts clearing. That's also safe. It won't send current through uh, if it, if the short isn't detected. Um, so it won't just blow voltage through the tube for no reason. Uh, so it's it, it's very safe to use compared to most testers, and it's also safe for if you hook up the clip leads wrong. Uh, if as long as you're doing the tests in order, uh, you know, starting with uh, filament voltage and then testing for shorts and then testing uh, emissions and cutoff, you won't be able to hook up the clip leads in the wrong order because you'll be failing tests way before you get to anything that could actually hurt the tube. Right. So I've never. Even even okay. when my dumb ass has hooked up stuff incorrectly <laughs> and it's three in the morning and I'm not paying attention, I've never damaged any tube doing that. So, Yeah, so the good thing is it's like if you do – this gets some important things here. If you do get find a tube tester, it definitely needs to be checked out and serviced. I'll mention the same thing on mine. Actually, mine was an older one. And I had to go through and re-solder the entire thing, like <laughs> reflow solder on every point, and it was the most insane circuit board. And I think there's only like two capacitors, huge ones, on it, and that's it. Like everything else was dials and resistors and wires. Uh, but there's you want to go in and, and check it out before you use it. Check it out, and then there's always a guide for like the process like you said mine has an exact process on how to go and test it it's like you don't just test this one thing at the end you have to go through and do the whole sequence of testing and then i do know for mine also there was a way to check calibration on it and actually dial in some calibration to make Mm -hmm. sure that like you're actually putting out the right voltage yeah yeah that you're saying your dial is putting out and that is extremely important especially it's especially important to make sure the filament voltages are all correct because you could blow your the filament if you put too high of a voltage into it 
Um, and also you'll get inaccurate emissions readings if your filament voltage is wrong because the higher the filament voltage, the more heat is in the neck, the higher emissions you're going to get on the test result. But the tube isn't going to be driven at that filament voltage when you put it back in the TV. It's only going to be driven at 6.3 volts or whatever the filament voltage happens to be. So you want to make sure that your tester can accurately test at the correct filament voltage for accurate results. Yeah. Hmm. Steve, how often are you using that device yourself? Your one? The problem with mine is, is it's just like what Andy had mentioned. I don't have uh, – I have to go make an actual adapter each time I want to use it. So yeah, yeah. like on mine, I've had – I had the 2530s. I had a ton of 2530s come in, and they all had this problem, and I was sure maybe it was a short in the tube. So I took one of those neck boards and made an adapter with that, and then I went in and, and tested every single tube and found out it, none of the tubes were bad. It's this stupid resistor assembly, uh, or the it's this weird resistor that's in the flyback path that's only on this specific monitor that goes bad. So... That's what I did. I had to each time go and make my own socket. And I've done it a couple other times with different PVMs, like L2 I did and M-series ones I've done. But every single time I've had to go, and I would much rather do what he's got, where I've got those – even the little nodes would be better than remaking them. The problem is my, my system was okay, but it only came with, like, two adapters okay. overall, and they were useless. Yeah. Yeah, That's the adapters the are very hard to find separated from the the right. tube tester. Uh, there are people that I've seen on eBay that make them by hand and sell them, but their inventory is very hit or miss. Like they'll be gone for a few years and then come back and make a few more. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like somebody like us or somebody. Yeah, is exactly. just Like, oh, I'm just exactly. gonna make fifty of these when I don't have anything to do this month, and mm -hmm. I'll sell them for a couple years. Because I've tried to reach out to that person, and he's like, "What do you need, Sony's?" No, I don't do those. And I'm just like, "Oh, okay, never mind." It's like more—they're more used to people using these equipment on arcade monitors. Yeah, like guys have been using these things on arcade cabinets for decades. And that's who's fighting over the testers on eBay is all the arcade operators. They want Sencor right. because okay. it's the best. And they're yeah. probably—they're more likely to have way more hours on them as well, or be at that kind of older stage where they've got to test the the monitor or it's it's yep. medium or something yeah uh, have you worked on many arcade monitors andy uh i've had many people ask me to uh logistically it's kind of hard for me uh just because my space is so limited uh but i do have a few that have been sitting on my on my list for a while when i when i do have the space um most most of what i work on is professional monitors uh and the rest is consumer stuff. Before we go, um, I wanted to ask you about the most recent RGB mod uh, on a little TV that you had. Um, did you were you listening to that one for sale? Was this it was like a, was it an Emerson or something? What was it? It was a Zenith. Zenith, that's it. This is like a little nine, ten inch one. Yep, they called them the Zenith Delights. Uh, they were little nine inch cubes. And they came in like four colors, I think. They're, the cutest ones are there's a pink one and a red one and like a baby blue one. I've never seen those locally. I've lo been looking for years, never found them. Um, the red ones come up on eBay eventually, but just like with sports cars, you know, red sells. So like they're always <laughs> like $350 for a red one. Um, so, yeah, I just had a little black one. It I bought it from some guy, some like scrapper in Texas that just, you know, one of those accounts on eBay that just lists all kinds of random crap every month. Um, and he had one in the original box and he pulled it out of the box and proved that it could turn on in the listing. And it was selling for like, buy it now for like one fifty. And I shot him an offer for 90 bucks shipped and he sent it to me. He sent it in the original box. And what I didn't know is that the original box had no packing material left in it. And he replaced the packing material with newspaper. But okay. miraculously, it did make it in, in <laughs> two pieces. Uh, and I managed to put it back together. You can't tell that it that it came apart. But yeah, I was pissed. 
<laughs> but and I eventually I, I ended up throwing the box throwing the box away because it was water damaged. It was like super soft, and of course it got beat up in shipping. So there was like no point in having the box. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a little nine inch tube, and it's actually nine inch viewable. So it's an inch bigger than than your little eight inch PVMs, right. and it doesn't have it's these. Are, I, I don't know if you've ever wondered or anyone watching has ever wondered why these little PVMs are so freaking long, even though they're so small. Um, and it's because they have these tubes in them, these little uh, Sony um, A20 and M20 tubes. These are incredibly long because they are 70 degree deflection angle. And that's referring to the angle from the bell to the neck. It's a really wide open angle. Um, and the lower the deflection angle is, the better your geometry and your picture quality is going to be because the electron beams are having to do less bending to oh, hit the sense. screen in the right place. Okay. Your normal professional tube is going to be a 90 degree deflection as long as it's below like 20 inches. Uh, the larger tubes, I I just don't see those really for... Uh, less than like 110 degree deflection, which is why your corner geometry starts to get kind of bad okay, is because they're, go, they're making yeah, the tube shallower. Really far out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why yeah. flat screen tubes have horrific geometry <laughs> is because they are very shallow. And then the screen, the front of the screen the is flat. flat. And that physics does not work that way. <laughs> the beams don't want to be shot at an angle onto a flat surface. The curved surface helps to preserve the geometry. So when you buy a flat screen tube, you're buying inferior physics. <laughs> That's I try I try a lot of people will send me pictures of their flat screens and they're like Look at this. How do I get this better? And I'm like, well, actually, that's as good as it's going to get for that flat screen. And they're like, no. And I'm like, uh, I'm telling you the truth. Like you said, the physics aren't there. I was like, you got to understand, this is the end of an era, too, where they're like, we just finally got this one style of CRT almost perfected. Now we're going to try flat screens. Oh, that didn't really work. Now we're in plasma load, you know, LCD yeah. land. So it wasn't like it was something that had – maybe they would have figured out a better way to do it if they'd have done it for 50 years like they did the tubes before that. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah, not it something just wasn't, that was done. No. It was – I like I, I don't have any proof of this, but I've always felt like it was kind of like a last-ditch effort to, to sell people a new TV before the technology changed. It was like the hot new thing, like, oh, you got to have a flat screen now. It looks so modern. You know, throw out your old bubble curve TV and buy a flat screen. And then a few years later, oh, now we have LCDs, you know. So I, not a lot of engineering went into the flat screens before that, you know, before they were out. Like, obviously enough went into them, but not nearly as, like you were saying, not nearly enough compared to the older design. No, not not nearly as much as like the 90s where the Trinity, like there was no vision of a f different format that was going to come in and replace a tube mm. at that point they're like this is still the most uh technologically advanced and capable display technology on the planet right now and in within the you know eye shot of that whereas when you get into that early 2000s when they made those other ones i'm sure that there was already developmental phases of these lcd panels yeah and things yeah, like that they were already aware of this so like yeah. you said, there's not there all the good engineers are over there trying to make the next big thing, not the last great yeah. hurrah for a CRT. A, a lot of the the engineering I've noticed went into the PC monitors because those got flat earlier because it was way more desirable That's to have true. and it you needed perfect geometry for a PC monitor because no one's gonna buy a monitor where their start bar is you know, bending up at the sides or whatever. It needs to be perfect. <laughs> and so that's, those are like fantastic examples of what a flat screen monitor should be. And consumer tubes, there's just no reason to dump enough money into those to get them to, to look right. Like this, this JVC I have over here is my, my prized possession. It's one of the, sorry about the camera work here. Um, it's the JVC DTV. It's the multi-format JVC. And those Use a flat screen Sony Trinitron clone uh, made by Mitsubishi uh, called the Diamondtron. Oh, yeah. And those 
tubes were used in the highest of high end monitors uh, at the time, like right. NEC's F series uh, and Sony's uh, GDM, like their upper level GDM stuff had equivalent tubes to that. And they're like a thousand TVL and they just have fantastic geometry and focus. Uh, and part of the reason for that is most PC monitors have uh, dual focus controls, which means, so I'll explain like normally all CRTs have a focus control and it's kind of like adjusting focus on, on like a lens or your, or your camera where there's like a perfect spot where you get very sharp focus in the middle, but you might be sacrificing some focus on the outer edges. So what most people recommend you do is you kind of adjust it just a little bit down so that you get uniform focus, even though it might not be the sharpest possible focus, you get uniform focus. Um, and the dual focus flybacks added a second focus control exclusively for the corners. So you didn't have to compromise anymore. You could dial in razor sharp focus on the center and on the edges. Um, and, and this one has that, uh, it's phenomenal monitor. If, if the, B, the BVMs can ever get one. will have those two, um, yeah, a lot of times. Yeah. They'll have the dual focus on their flybacks. And, um, yeah, that that's a good point. The one that I have is a flat screen tube on the Sony. And it's, you know, that style of uh, whatever that you're talking about, the, C the GDM. And it has phenomenal geometry. And, of course, it's also running at the higher kilohertz, you know, mm -hmm. signal. So it's a little bit different. And it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not you're not just sending in 240p and getting it on the screen on that monitor. Yeah. But there's a boatloads more hardware inside that shell of that CRT than there is in any of the consumer flat screen uh, television sets that you'll find. Not a single one of those will have that much hardware in it as a 19-inch. Yeah. And they'll all be t twice as big as that. Yeah. And, and the build quality is going to be way different too like the right the, those consumer lower. those tvs when you those consumer tvs you open them up the board is just slid in on some plastic rails flapping around you know on its own weight the pcb material is like the cheapest possible thing they could have used which is why they always have cracks and damage in them it's just you're some bad solder on some of them i know that yeah. there's like some there's like some chassis i keep hearing other people i don't work on them as much but it's like a whole chassis series that was made from a certain factory in Mexico that a lot of them were supposedly recalled or something, I think. <laughs> and they like this, the specific soldering done at this chassis is like notorious for uh, cold solder joints now. Cause of, so of course, like you open one and it's got not just one cold solder joint, it's like 80 cold solder joints. So, Oh my God. I yeah. worked. I worked. One of the more unique monitors that someone brought me in the last couple of months was a Sony KV twenty nine hundred. I think was the model. Oh it, yes, I saw that. That was a very cool one. The one you added. Uh, um, so you go ahead. Yeah. It had a SCART port on the back from factory, and it was Euro SCART. It wasn't JP twenty one. So it was like I was reading through the manual on it, and it really seemed like some kind of. TV that was meant to be sold like worldwide. It supported every uh, over the air channel standard. It had like every country listed and like how to like tune into those channels. And um, it had the SCART port on the back for Euro SCART. Um, and inside design wise, it looked like a very cheap version of the PVM of the same size. It had the same like wing boards on either side. But they were using this weird design where the boards had edge connectors on them, almost like you're slotting in a card in your computer. Yeah. And the edge connectors, like if I like bumped the boards ever so slightly, the picture would go crazy because these shitty connectors they used. So I took the whole thing apart and like sprayed the connectors with deoxid, tried to clean them all up as best I could and uh, it recapped a bunch of caps that were bad. And um, the boards were huge on the sides, but only like a third of them were populated with components. They basically put in the minimum amount possible to get the thing to work. Um, they took out all the extra geometry adjustments, everything. Uh, I, I'm really not sure like where it lands in the, in the timeline of Sony's TVs, but it was bizarre. Uh, I, and the, the power, sorry, the power supply 
this is why I started talking about it. The power supply was recalled because it had a tendency to catch fire. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's something I was going to say. I think a lot of those I'm wondering if they didn't just make a bunch of the parts for like the PVM 2950 and like the they thought they were going to sell a bunch of them and maybe they just didn't sell as many as they thought. And they said, well, here, let's make a thousand of this special TV that can be used anywhere. And like you said, they're using all the same circuit boards. They're just populating as little as possible of it. Cause I saw the inside of that TV and it looked very similar yeah. uh, to the 2950. Yeah. Just a lot of it chopped out. Yep. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. The only thing it had going for it besides the SCART port was it had a Japanese Trinitron tube in it, you know, and the, and from what I've been told by the kind of the older crowd in the CRT community is that those tubes were superior uh, just with the, the build standard that they were held to compared to the ones that they started making in the American plants for the consumer TVs. Um, and I think you can tell the difference because the label color, obviously it says made in Japan or made in USA, but Right off the bat, I think the Japanese ones have blue labels and the American ones have red labels. I might be wrong on that, but that's kind of my been my observation. Okay. Yeah, that's a cool point. Yeah, it was still an A-class consumer too, but it was a yeah, uh, blue label great. It was made in Japan. It's still a great um, – it's like a great set, but like you say, it's like so funny that they'd have so many different models because I feel like too there's been some other people that have told me – um, almost the same similar thing where it's like there's an American version of this NTSC set, you know, of this size TV that's very similar and it's got maybe even less components in it than the one you had because it's just doing the NTSC stuff, right? And it's just, oh, like, that's all. So wow. they just, there's, um, that's why I think too that people get kind of like, they fall in love with things like the 2950 or these very large CRTs. And when you work on them, you realize there's not, I don't think like there's that big of a, I don't know. It, to me, it's like, it's, it's still just trying to do too much on too large of a screen. And it, it's very yeah. hard to still make it look like what your dreams of like some perfect analog picture are going to be. You need, what was your, I've been meaning to ask you this. I, have not worked. I have not had the pleasure of working on an NEC XM series monitor yet. Someone contacted me. They want me to work on it, but they need me to go to them because it's such a huge TV. They don't want to move it. <laughs> so I've been putting it off and I want to know oh what your impression gosh. is of that TV. So like both picture wise and build, build quality. No, they like, they are very high quality built. The one I worked on, uh, the 29 inch one was very high quality built. And again, it had, I mean, they were smart. They installed three loud ass fans, you know, inside it to keep that the was forward down. thinking. Yeah, that makes it last longer. And and so um, luckily there's you know, you can't just like buy Noctua fans that and plug them in. You have to splice them in the old cable for some reason. Uh, so I did that and that wasn't a problem. I heard other people say they were having issues with it, but uh, I, I try to I, I don't know whether they're doing something wrong when they're trying to install their fan. But once I quieted those fans, it was great. I did recap like the deflection board and the power supply, but there are three or four boards in there that are just filled with SMD caps. And I told that guy, I was like, look, I'm not opening this can of worms just because the monitor's working fine. I recap. Thankfully, like the SMD boards are located right under those fans and in cooler areas. So there's Excellent. constantly yeah. like cold air blown over them. So I didn't notice any of them had failed. And this one was from like 2000. Um, once it worked, man, it was awesome. I wish I could get one. I mean, that was like, yeah. I, I think that one is way better than the Sony version. Uh, just yeah. as an overall usable mm-hmm. monitor. Uh, and it's, it's got a, a ton mask. of inputs. Yeah. And it's a shadow mess, but it's got a ton of inputs. And yeah, the build quality on those is really stellar like it's metal inside once you get the frame off it's a lot like the uh 2030 style a little bit but definitely easier to work in it's not as big of a pain how you can pull the each board out individually you know and easily service it so it's very serviceable 
What about like the corner focus and performance for the size? Like, is it better than? I mean, typical? it's yeah, it's 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 better than probably anything else that I would have. Yeah. I mean, it would have been better than like the JVC. It's so weird. Sometimes you'll get this stuff. I noticed this about like the last forty inch one I looked at. That was a Mitsubishi tube. How it had I, I was blown away how it would somehow had really good side focus and way better geometry and stuff so if the yoke set right but then it had issues with purity you know it could never get pure so but this one's i think a nice mix of everything i don't think they could make it one bit bigger but there was <laughs> nothing glaring about that like i left that the guy who got it done has loved it you know and wants to bring other big monitors here but I, it's so big um, yeah, uh, and it's can, it's very dirty usually inside because of all yeah. those fans. Yeah, like, that makes tons sense. of crap. <laughs> tons of crap. Condition. So this guy so... wants you to travel to see the monitor. I'm gonna need overnight expenses. I'm gonna need a <laughs> right? I'm gonna it's like need you're talking a, a lot of money. Yeah. Like, get your butt up here and drive. The, well, then you got. Then how are you gonna? That's the problem, Andy. You're gonna have to have. Like that one, you can't just like fix it a day. Yeah, it, I. That's why I, I've been putting it off. It's. It's it's a lot to bring the tools out, but there's just certain things that I still wouldn't be wanting to all do in a day. Like I need mm -hmm. to be able to set it, you know, up here or something and just mm -hmm. have time, you know, to off and on to work on it. I don't like going somewhere and then just working for, you know, three or four hours straight and sweating, working on the floor, you know, trying to trying to do it. I've done it a few times and it's just not. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I do remember that that one was a pain because you had to, it had the shell on it where you have to like lean the shell forward or I had to put the tube down on its face because it had screws in the bottom uh, of the plastic, like, you know, at the middle, Yeah. like, you know, way down in the middle to get the shell off. It was just Phillips head screws, but it did have some on the bottom. <laughs> so I, I had to get like a, you know, you have to have a big enough spot to f safely turn that thing on its face and then turn it back so um i'll be honest working on that thing i didn't want i don't want to work on another one because <laughs> it's too much going on and it's like it's it's nerve-wracking i mean to work on those those bigger monitors that have more boards in them yeah I, you're more worried about screwing something up than yeah. fixing something yeah absolutely whenever people bring me stuff that's in working condition if it's super complicated like that, I just tell them, look, just wait until it has a problem. Like, don't go looking for problems that don't exist. Don't tell me to recap your whole tube just because you heard that that was something you wanted, like, done online. It's just a waste <laughs> of my time. It's a waste of your money. Just wait until something doesn't work. It's not like it's going to be unfixable once something stops working, you know. Um, if the caps are leaking, you know, I I'm fine doing inspections. I'll inspect stuff just to make sure the condition's good. Um, and if I think caps are leaking, then of course I would recommend replacing those just to prevent corrosion and, and damage. But if something's working and the caps are in good shape and it's, you know, not that old, don't, don't go looking for problems. <laughs> yeah. There's not, unless there's something that, um, like you're aware of, uh, a factory defect or something, yeah. which happened and, the red, green, blue line thing is a good example sometimes where there's just things that happen. Yeah. And Sony comes out with a bulletin. So there's certain items where, yeah, you can go ahead and preventatively do that. But like you said, it's best to just go in and inspect everything. Because on the flip side of the, what you just said, I've, I've run into monitors that will power on and they'll look okay. And then, like, I'd pull the power supply and one of the caps is leaking, busted, and gone. But it still would turn on and, and operate. So. Yeah. In that situation, an inspection is going to be even better because then you can replace that part and just get it back into working condition and prevent yeah. more damage. Exactly. And sometimes things will look fine. Like, let's say you picked up a monitor that's been dormant for the last 10 years uh, and you haven't even played on it yet. You bring it to me and I inspect it and it looks fine. You have to turn it on and run it for several hours to, to kind of get the, the caps flowing and, and warmed up and everything. Cause that's the point at which some of them will start to leak if they're going to leak. Um, so that's part of the inspection is to, is to make sure you put some hours into it uh, and see if, if it uh, starts leaking or not. Um, yeah. Looks can be I think Andy, what more 
topic I want to know about from you is, I mean, you've got a lot of CRTs moving in and out of your facility there. What are some of your thoughts on packaging CRTs and what are you doing to make sure they're not damaged in transit? Um, well, that's mostly why I deal locally. <laughs> oh, okay. Is oh, I yeah, don't yeah. like people shipping me CRTs unless they're like really insistent on it. Someone is sending me another one of these uh, Panasonic AG 500s because uh, the VCR doesn't work and uh, the picture is dim. Um, and I had them actually do some testing on it before they sent it to me because I didn't want money to be wasted on something that you know was going to be a rabbit hole of diagnostics and you know i think he's spending like 150 bucks to ship it to me or something it's yeah, it's crazy um but yeah the the b plus voltage which is like the main of uh, power rail for the tv is is low so likely there's a there's a there's a shorted cap or, or something's blown up inside and it's That's it's funny. making the power to the vcr so weak that it can't run the motors and it's okay. uh the picture is is very dim because of it it was working fine he used it for a few hours and then it went, you know, <laughs> Yeah. so that's exactly what goes back to the, the whole inspection process of why you put hours into these things before you just assume they're good. The one I, the example I was talking about of the power supply with the leaking cap was the AG. Well, it was an AG, the power supply. Yep. And it was, that's that unusual because Panasonic caps are, are some of the best. Um, well, it was Rubicon caps. They still oh. exploded. Yeah. They were gross. <laughs> sure, that smelled great. I, that's what people always like, oh, Rubic Rubicon's not supposed to fail. I'm like, dude, this cap's 30 years old. Yeah, caps. Of course, it's, it's yeah. going to fail eventually. Yeah. <laughs> it's got electrolytic fluid in it. Yeah. Uh, nice one. So, Andy, what's your local area if people do want to, you know, they think you're, you're a good option for them? Where are you based? I'm in Northern California, uh, specifically San Francisco. So, if you're in Northern California, that's pretty accessible no matter where you are. Um, I've had people drive a few hours to get to me or whatever. Um, and if you asked about like shipping stuff, I do have some recommendations. Um, I've had a few people successfully do the pool noodle thing that, that you've shown, Steve. Uh, that seems to be a good option. Uh, for, for tubes that are 13 inches or lower, uh, I really recommend this stuff called Instapack. Uh, it's the pack is PAK and it's this expanding, I don't know what it's made of, but it's kind of best way I can describe it is it's expanding foam. Uh, yeah, it's those little it's, bags that you like crack and they just heat up yes. and it expands into a shape. Yeah. It causes a chemical reaction and it expands. Yeah. And the important part is that it contours itself to all the edges in the corners of the screen to essentially mimic whatever injection molded styrofoam the TV was originally shipped yeah. with from the factory. Yeah. And it's a better material than styrofoam because it's not uh, hard. It has a little bit of give to it. So it can, it can absorb shock. Um, it's especially better than if you, let's say you still have your factory box, that styrofoam is dried out. Like it expires, you know, it, it, when it's exposed to, to moisture or heat or whatever, it just becomes brutal and it's useless. So you can't rely on having factory boxes. You can't rely on having flight cases. I've had people send me stuff in those before, and it still gets destroyed. Uh, yeah, you me need too. I've had you people need send flight cases break. You need yeah, shock UPS absorbing care. material. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah you've got to have it. it. They don't care. Like I've had, um, I've just gotten to the point now where I tell people not to. You're, you're. I don't care how good you pack it. If you're going to send it ground shipping by UPS or FedEx. You are still at risking shipping yeah. damage. I mean, I had the most recent. They they shipped one that was in the U line box that was all uh, wood, the wood box with the pallet under it. I saw that one, and they yeah. still broke the TV inside it. It's like they still <laughs> kicked it off. The, they see uh, it as a challenge. I swear I to God, they're like, "Oh, like it's a, a big foot, box. Like Let's a throw footprint it." Footprint in the side of the box, and then. A 13 inch shows up here from FedEx and they did the same thing. They broke that one. And that was one that they like the guy went into the FedEx and said, here, please pack this for me. And so he went to a FedEx location <laughs> and it was a joke, man. They put like crumpled paper in the bottom of a big box, wrapped it once with green bubble wrap and then put paper on top of it. 
and it's just like it got here and it's like the ace ventura joke it's like yeah <laughs> yeah and they they didn't even come to get it because they packed it they just paid insurance on it they didn't even come yeah, get it from don't me. don't rely on the fact that oh i've had people reason with that with oh well you know they're liable for it so they'll they'll pack it right no they won't they don't they'll care that they're liable it. for it it'll still break and then you're out an irreplaceable piece of electronics you know just pack it yourself pack it the right way or don't ship it at all um assume that anything you buy off of ebay is going to be packed in the dumbest way possible uh you know don't risk a lot of money on ebay purchases unless it's going to be freight shipped uh, I only yeah. buy CRTs off eBay when it's a funny deal, you know, like like you got with that JVC right, uh, yeah. recently. You know, that's low risk. It's a common t- tube, so, you know, if if it breaks, like, that's sad, but, you know. Uh, but even then, like, I, ha- I hesitate to do it. I like local pickups. I would prefer picking up something from e-waste than risking yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen to it on the route from eBay to me. The, the only thing I'll say is um – I have a lot of people that do want to ship big things in, and I don't even. I say the only thing I recommend anymore is the U ship or a freight style service. U ship has done awesome for me. Like when people can get a get a U ship job and can get it booked, they they've done nothing but you know good because it's usually it's just a guy that drives. Yeah. A small, it's a it's, small trucking outfit with either a, a pull behind covered trailer. The guy gets your monitor in the box, and you watch him go and strap it to the side of the truck, and it doesn't move till it gets offloaded, and it's usually like within a day. Yeah. And so, like the last two times, it's been like that, or it's been in the back of a um, a, a, one of those tr- shipping sprinter vans. It's like. Those, 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 if you can find that, those guys do great. They have like a 98% satisfaction. And that the only reason sense. they, the only reason they get a, a 2% breaking is because they get an auto accident. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can't prevent that chance. No. So that happens. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. It's a single set of hands, you know, the whole way that guy's responsible for it. So his, you know, butt is on the line if uh, something happens to your items. Whereas FedEx, UPS, there's no accountability. There's no they, – they deal in such high volumes. No one cares if you throw something or throw it off a, a truck or whatever. Uh, I talked to someone that used to work uh, on the line in UPS, and he said that their processing facilities have a mandatory five-foot drop for everything. That gets ground shipped. No matter what it is, how big the box is, or how it's packed, they it rolls off a conveyor belt five feet onto the floor. <laughs> so if you don't think your box can survive a five foot drop, <laughs> don't ship it. Well, that oh explains God. perfectly how that stinking U line thing broke because it looks like it took, seriously took a five foot drop and it pushed the uh, a bit. You know, it it took like a, such a hard impact that it. It sh- it shot the the base of the PVM up into the uh, area. It shot the whole bottom, broke yeah. it in half, and pushed oh it upwards. Gosh. Yeah, that's sad. That's what I told him. I was like, thankfully we could get it back to working, and it was good and saved it. I had another. They destroyed the little button, the push button, and uh, turn on. <laughs> those are always I was like, well. Those always get damaged. And thankfully, I bought. I I went to. I googled the part like six or eight months ago, and some company told me they had new old stock in stock. And I was like, "Bull crap!" So I was like, "I'm taking the chance and I'm ordering it." So I ordered it, and of course, it was this. It sent me an email. Thank you for your order. Uh, we will notify you once we find your part. And, <laughs> and like, yeah. it's not. It's not in immediate stock. And I was like, "You got to be kidding me! What a yeah. what a scam!" And it, it was four months later, I got an email <laughs> notice and it said, we have your part ready. It's shipping tomorrow. And then it showed up in the mail. And I was like, well, thankfully I have this part because I was, I ordered it two years ago and it's shown up. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Well, anyway, I guess we'll, we're going to wrap it up soon. We'll be going for quite a while. I know you've got yeah. stuff to do. You've got a busy day. Yeah. Andy, so you're not at the you're not doing the software today, is that right? You're you're at home working today, or how does it work? Uh, I just I took the morning off. It's it's fine. Oh, yeah. that's very nice yeah. of you. Yeah, please, yeah, thank thanks. You, sir. No, I get I get I I enjoyed my morning. 
<laughs> well, yeah, so if you if you um, do most people reach out to you, how do most people reach out to you to get um, service quotes or work done? You can head to my website, the crtdatabase.com. Uh, there's a contact page or contact link on top and that gives a rundown of services and everything, console mods, CRT stuff. Uh, at the bottom of that page, there's two options to contact me. There's a, uh, option to join my discord, um, which you're welcome to do. Even if you're not local, just, you know, join it so that you can then DM me or, uh, you can just email me. There's a, there's an email form on bottom. Great. Okay, good. Well, Eddie, you are, you do a great mate. Uh, your your efforts at documentation are amazing and very much appreciated by the community. The catdatabase.com is a great resource and uh, I hope you keep growing and, and thank you for doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely will. I've actually got a few people helping me now, so uh, hopefully the content will start appearing. Uh, mostly for RGB mods. That's what you're going to that's what I've been posting on Twitter so anytime anyone adds an RGB mod. Um, that's popular. another thing I, Everybody if, wants to know. yeah, if you're watching and, and you have uh, knowledge of this stuff or you have a collection that you want to have documented, get in contact with me and, and we'll work that out too. I'm always looking for interesting stuff to post on the website. Oh, good. Excellent. All right, Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for getting into it. Oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for, uh, leading it. And thanks Andy for coming on today. Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure talking to both of you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope you learned something about CRT repair. We'll see you next week.